A really quick note before we start the actual lesson, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, it's come to my attention that uh, there is uh, a population in the class that is uh, feeling like we're doing too much theory, and this last couple of chapters has been a lot of theory. I'll acknowledge that. This one next chapter, the WKB approximation, is also fairly theoretical, um, but it's just one lesson. I'm going to just move on. And, uh, and we'll get directly to some applications, including uh, lasers, laser cooling, uh, time-dependent problems, and uh, hopefully that will be more palatable for those of you who are eager to actually see some real numbers and work with actual applications. I hope that helps, and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, I've got a quick set of sides, slides here for Lesson 20. It's actually uh, <clears throat> not that complicated, so maybe... Uh, Maybe this will be easy. All right, so let's talk about uh, what is the WKB approximation? Um, what are we going to do with it? Basically, there's two primary applications. The um, You can do approximate bound state energies of various systems, and um, you can handle tunneling. So most of the time, you're working in one dimension, although there are ways to make it work in higher dimensions. But uh, let's talk about the basic idea. <coughs> The notion is, if I've got a potential that's fairly slowly changing, and um, in such a way that the wavelength is short, say, compared to the distance over which the potential changes a lot, then I can approximate a sort of local phase, or local f spatial frequency, local wave number k, um, using the uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy is equal to a constant. And that gives me a way to estimate <coughs> what k is, and, uh, and then I can integrate k dx in order to get the local phase. So the notion is that the wave function goes something like e to the i integral k of x dx, instead of just k times x, where k is a constant, k is now a function of x, and so to get the phase we need to integrate it. And then there's the notion that it, it goes like 1 over the square root of the wave number. And that's a simple consequence of the fact that, uh, as remember, wave numbers like momentum. So uh, as the momentum gets larger, the probability of finding the particle at a place with high momentum is less than the probability of finding the particle at a place with low momentum. But this is a very weak dependence, because notice that the amplitude goes like 1 over the square root of k, but k goes like the square root of the energy, or the kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy doubles, the amplitude is only going to change due to this factor out in front by about 20%, because it's the square root of 2 and the square root of that. So it's, uh, it's not a very big effect. In order for the amplitude to change by a factor of 2, um, then the kinetic energy has to change according to that factor out in front, the, the amplitude factor, um, by something like a factor of 16. So a lot of times we can just ignore that factor out in front and just worry about the phase. In fact, it's the phase is all you really need to get the bound state energy. The idea is, if I've got some kind of a potential, let's say, that varies in sp space, and uh, at s any given energy, the notion is that uh, there will be some turning points. And so the idea is that the total phase between the turning points has to be something like an integer number of pi. Uh, if you think about a round trip, um, it tr if it traverses the space between the turning points twice and you want a total phase change of 2 pi, um, then between the turning points you'd want a, a phase change of pi. Now, the nature of the turning points turns out to affect the details of exactly what you get. Um, it turns out that if you have a hard boundary, like an infinite square well boundary, the wave function goes to zero, and the phase starts then at a definite place. But if you've got a soft boundary, like this depicted here, then the wave function doesn't go to zero at the boundary, and there's a little bit of sloppiness in the phase, and that's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Let's, uh, and also, of course, the point is that uh, inside, where the potential is less than the energy, you get a sinusoidal behavior. But uh, if you look at the integral up there, if you go back and look at the definition of k, when v is greater than e, 
then the k becomes imaginary, and of course this turns from a complex exponential to a real exponential. And, uh, and we expect to see decaying exponentials outside where the energy is less than the potential. Um, so here's a typical example how it might turn out. Um, notice that there are turning points, and uh, at the turning points, the general behavior of the wave function goes from sinusoidal to exponential. And you also notice that the wave function does go up a little bit as a result of the kinetic energy dropping, um, but not a lot. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you see that the wave function uh, spills over the turning, the turning point. I, I wish I... I guess I can't exactly point here, but anyway, if you look at the right turning point, the wave function, it behaves as if it, it could continue sinusoidally and go to zero a little bit past the turning point, and the same way on the left. We're going to find out that that represents, basically, an eighth of a wavelength. In other words, there's an eighth of a wavelength shift when the boundary is soft, as, as is depicted here. But if the boundary is hard, like an infinite square well, or a point where the wave function goes to zero, then there is no spillover. The wave function goes to zero right at the boundary. And we'll work some examples in class and see how that turns out. The other thing is, uh, if you look in phase space, <coughs> if you look at k as a function of x, um, what you get are these sort of phase space trajectories. You can think of these classically. Uh, this could be like a oscillator that's oscillating back and forth. It's got turning points. Each of the lines here represents a line of constant energy. But uh, the bound states occur when the uh, area enclosed by one of these curves is 2 pi greater than the area enclosed by the previous curve. In, in other words, if you know one bound state energy and you can draw the curve of constant energy for that bound state, the next bound state happens when you get an additional 2 pi of phase. Um, and so the, <coughs> the area in these uh, ellipsoids, I guess, that this is a simple harmonic oscillator potential, but the area between these neighboring bound state energies happens to be 2 pi. The area of the central one depends on the boundary conditions. So um, if the boundary conditions are hard on both sides, the area of the central one is 2 pi. If you got one soft boundary, then you take away... Um, basically pi over 2. If you have another soft boundary, you take away another pi over 2. And, uh, and that's how you get uh, the energy of the simple harmonic oscillator ends up being n plus a half. That half comes from the area of that, of that central guy. And the last application that we're going to deal with is, uh, is tunneling. You guys remember tunneling from last semester. It wasn't really in the book, but I talked about it anyway. Uh, what we talked about last semester was actually the WKB approximation. So you take this expression that we uh, cook up by um, assuming that the potential changes slowly compared to the uh, wavelength, and, and then you see what happens when V is greater than E. When that happens, the K becomes imaginary, so we think of this as a kappa. You define kappa to be... It's the same definition as k, except the v and the e are swapped. So now kappa is real, and uh, you plug that in to the WKB approximation, and you get an expression for the uh, relative amplitude on the right side of the barrier compared to the left side of the barrier. So, And we've done this before, so you guys don't really have anything new to learn here, but I just wanted to point out that, uh, that this is the WKB approximation that allowed us to make this claim, and it, it really isn't... Uh, isn't that hard to use. All right. Well, that's enough rambling for today. I think we'll, uh, we'll see you guys in class.